All right, so we're going to pick up uh, with looking at what the Bible has to say about this whole idea of spiritual authority. And what we have to do to understand this, the authority that Jesus gives to the church and us as parts of the church, is we have to understand how God operates in his authority on planet Earth. And in order to understand that, we have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And actually, in the very first chapter of Genesis, we start to get some insight into how God is ordering his world. And so um, he basically comes to Adam and Eve, our first parents, and he and I'm going to put some some verses up on the screen here. But he basically says, you guys, I am I'm God. I'm the sovereign over all of the universe. But what I want to do is I want to include you in what I am doing in this world. And I'm going to give you some responsibility. And as I give you that responsibility, I'm also going to delegate you some authority so that you can operate. And so when we get to the Garden of Eden in, in chapter one, what you've got is you've got God and you've got Adam and Eve. And then there's beautiful place, uh, the Garden of Eden. And it's really an overlap of heaven and earth. And so God says, what I want you, Adam and Eve, to do and all of your descendants, the rest of humanity, is I want you under my authority. I want you to go out into the rest of the world. I want you to fill it. And I want you to bring my order, my ways, my authority out into planet Earth. You're going to have a part to play in all of this. And so we see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. And that word dominion is an authority word. And basically, he says to them, I didn't put the whole uh, verse up on the screen here, but he says, I'm going to give you dominion over the animals and all of these things and over the whole earth. So you have some responsibility. I want you to tend and I want you to guard and I want you to keep uh, this earth and I want you to go out and make the rest of the earth like the garden. You have some responsibility. You have a part to play. And what's fun is, is you can even see God sharing some of this responsibility in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. And we used to tell stories about this in Sunday school to our kids that Adam got to name the animals. And, and God basically said, okay, Adam, I created them, but I'm going to share some responsibility here. You get to pick their names. And whatever Adam called them, that's what, that's what they were called. And I just think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so, so what we see, and, and, we, and you can do a bigger uh, Bible study into this, is that God takes some of his authority and he delegates it, or he shares it with humanity. And, and so we don't know exactly how much God gives to Adam and Eve, uh, but, but we know he gives him some, a certain level of responsibility and authority. And this gives us insight into why the snake is hanging around in the garden. So as, as you know, sometimes we read the story of Genesis uh, 3, where the serpent, he comes and he tempts Eve and then Adam, and then they blow it in the fall. And we go, well, the enemy's just there just to get him to sin, and, get it, and he just wants to mess things up. And on a basic level, that's true. But he's also there for something else. The enemy knows that God has given a certain amount of delegated responsibility and authority to humanity so that now humanity is operating on planet Earth. And what Lucifer wants is he wants access. He wants to be able to operate on planet Earth. And so as he is tempting Adam and Eve, and they ultimately sin, we call that the fall of man, Somehow in that whole thing that goes down, the enemy somehow gets access to some of that authority and starts to operate on planet Earth through Adam and Eve's sinful choice. 
Uh, he didn't get all authority. He can't just start ruling the planet, but he got some. And scholars believe uh, that in that, he, is, he was seeking the right to rule, um, and that in every sinful act and sinful choice that has happened since that first one, all the way up through human history, somehow through human sinful choices and rebellion, the enemy is gaining a little bit of access and authority to operate. How much we can't quantify, but he's getting some. And so he can't just rule the world how he wants to, but he operates to the degree that humans sin and give him access. And you go, okay, Kevin, like, I've never maybe heard that before. Is that really in the Bible? Is that really true? Well, let me, let me um, kind of take it forward from Adam to the time of Jesus. From Adam to the time of Jesus, how much sinning went on on planet Earth? A little bit or a lot? How many wars? How many murders? How many idols were worshipped? Child sacrifice, just terrible things. All sorts of debauchery and evil. Like a lot of a lot of a lot happened from Genesis to Jesus. And if it's true that the enemy, somehow through all of these sinful choices, is gaining some sort of access, then it would, it would be logical to think that when Jesus shows up on planet Earth uh, 2,000 years ago, the enemy would have a whole lot of authority and access at that point. Would that make sense? And is that in the Bible? It actually is. So if you look at when Jesus goes after he's baptized... And it says that the Spirit of God led him out into the desert to face off with the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Lucifer and Jesus are having a conversation. And the devil says something very interesting to Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verse 6. He says to Jesus, he says, basically, if you'll worship me, Jesus, I will give you all the authority. There's that word again. I'll give you, Jesus, all the authority and splendor of the nations because it has been given to me. Who gave it to him? It wasn't God who gave it to him. It was us who gave it to him. And he basically says, I can give it to whoever I want. Now, you go, well, the devil's bluffing. But was he? Did Jesus call his bluff and go, no, devil, you can't do anything and you don't have any authority and you don't have any access and you're bluff. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't say you're bluffing. Uh, and so um, at that point in the redemptive story of humanity, um, the devil does have some access. He does have some authority. How much? As much as Adam and all his sons and daughters after him uh, have allowed so here's, here's a question. How much access does the devil have in Fayetteville, Arkansas tonight? How much, how much space does he have to operate in Fayetteville, Arkansas tonight? I think it's as much as people are out there sinning their heads off and allowing him access. How much access does he have in Las Vegas? I mean, we don't call it sin, sin, sin City for no reason, right? I mean, there's a lot of, lot of access, I think, that's going on in Las Vegas. And you can just kind of look around different cities and places around the world, and you go, man, that city's really dark. Trust me, I've done missions. I was a full-time missionary for 20 years, got to travel to over 40 different countries. I've been to some very, very dark places. And you go, man, why is it so dark and evil here compared to other places that you've been. And then you start to get into the history of those people and what they've done throughout centuries and generations, and you go, oh, okay, this makes some sense. So here's the thing, you guys, before we go doomsday, <laughs> don't go doomsday, and go, oh man, what hope is there for us? And what hope is there for the planet? We have to stop right here and, and talk about what did Jesus accomplish 
on the cross and through his resurrection specifically, what did he do to the devil? This is really, really important to get our thinking right here. And Paul gives us some insight into what Jesus did. And we see it in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, there's that word again, the authorities, it says he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so what did Jesus do in the cross? It says that he stripped the devil of authority. So there is a major power shift that has happened through Jesus' cross and his resurrection. You guys, that is a defining moment in history. Not just for your personal salvation and forgiveness and for my personal salvation and forgiveness. It is. It is that deciding moment. But guys, it changes the whole balance of power on the planet forever. And, and so Paul is basically, he, he is calling this out. He's saying that Jesus triumphed. So this is a huge game changer. And so what did Jesus do after his resurrection? Before he goes and he ascends back to the Father and he's seated on the throne, he stops off and he gives some things to the church. And so remember, we talked about church gates, keys, and this thing that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, my ecclesia, my called out ones who are actually going to have some authority and some responsibility to, to have some say in how things go here in this town. He stops off and he gives the church power and authority. Again, we don't operate in, in pushing back the enemy in our own power. It's not my power. It's not my authority. It is Jesus' power and authority. And so he gives us the authority and the power to resist the works of the devil. And that's why when you see Matthew 28, which we usually use this as a missions kind of verse, that's usually the way that I always hear it taught, is it's all about the going uh, to the nations, and it is that. But usually when I hear people quote this verse, the Great Commission, they should jump right over the first words. And what does Jesus say? He says, all what? Authority. Do you see it? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Basically, what Jesus is saying is in my authority and in my power, go out and fulfill this commission. Go out and fulfill this commission. And actually, this commission that he gives to the church is really a reframing of that original commission in Genesis 1.26 that he gave to Adam and humanity before the fall, where he said, you guys, I want you to go out and I want you to bring my order and my ways and fill the earth. And, and, and so really what he's saying here is, you guys, now in my victory and authority, I want you to go out and take ground in my name. So how do we do this? And how does it work for us? I want to give a couple of illustrations or analogies that sort of help me to think about how this works. Um, and a couple of the ones that I can think of that are probably uh, the closest that I can get. Uh, the first one would be a power of attorney. So, so, so my friend Joe, who's sitting in the back there, I'll pick on Joe tonight. Um, so Joe, where do you do your banking? Where do, you, where do you keep your money? Okay, I was hoping you wouldn't say under a mattress. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so our vest. So, um, so Joe, what if I go down to your bank tomorrow and I, I go up to the teller and I say, give me all of Joe Covey's money. What are they going to do? Yeah, they might even call security, right? They're like, let's see some ID. And they're like, you ain't Joe Covey. So you're not getting his money. But if I start demanding, they will call security. Right? But what if I go to Arvest tomorrow and I've got a piece of paper and it's notarized and it has Joe's name and it has my name 
and it has Joe's signature and my signature has both of our names and it says power of attorney and I hand that to them and I say, give me all Joe's money. What's gonna happen? They're gonna give me all of Joe's money. Well, you know what I've just done? I have just transacted in Joe's name. Do you see what, see what I've just done here? I have, I, have, I have transacted in Joe's name. You guys, this is how we operate on planet Earth now. When we use the name of Jesus, and, and we say, in the name of Jesus, um, devil back off. Again, it's, it's not me using my own name and my own authority, but I am delegated authority to use his name, and it is effective. And stuff happens. Um, another way that I like to think about this is by, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, like, I grew up, uh, some of you I know did too, and there were all these Western movies. It seems like Western movies, I don't know if that's a thing completely of the past. Uh, you don't see as many of them today, but there are all these Western movies. I've got a few favorites. Um, but like my parents' generation, they grew up with John Wayne. And John Wayne, the Duke, he was usually the sheriff. And so he would, he'd be in a town and he'd have this big sheriff's badge. Everybody knew John Wayne, the sheriff, uh, he's got real authority and he's got real guns, and he can arrest the bad guys. Now, can all the regular citizens in the town arrest the bad guys? No, they can't. Only John can because he has been authorized by whatever, you know, if, if he's uh, you know, a deputy of whatever state or whatever, he's a Texas marshal, he's given authority by the higher powers to arrest the bad guys. But what if, and you're watching these movies, he goes, you know what? I can't, I'm not gonna do this alone, so I need to create deputies. And so he starts handing out these little badges that say deputy on them, and he starts pinning them on people's chests, and he goes, deputized, 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 deputized. Now who has the authority to go out and arrest the bad guys? Those, those you know, townspeople now have real authority. Um, and, and so when I think about this, you guys, I think about, again, us as the church of Jesus, those of us who make up the church as his followers, when we use his name and his authority and we pray, and that's how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up tonight, is one of the very specific ways that we exercise our authority in Jesus and we push back against the enemy uh, uh, and his, his dominion is we do it through prayer, and we're going to talk about that. But I want to show you something um, that is a, a cool thing when you read the Gospel of Luke. Jesus actually gave his 12 disciples a pretaste of what we get permanently. And it's in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. So he says to his disciples, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Uh, I, I think this is figurative and spiritual language. I'm like, I, I don't think they were going out stomping on, on real snakes and scorpions, but he, he says this, I, I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the evil one. How much power of the evil one? Just a little bit? Just in the easy places, the one, those, those, powers of darkness that aren't as big and scary? No, he says, all. All the power of the evil one, nothing will harm you. So he gives the 12 this pre-taste. This is pre-resurrection. But now, because I, I, I know some of us would go, well, wait a minute, Kevin, wait a minute. Um, if Jesus stripped the devil of authority at the cross, and then he deputized us as the church, like there's a new sheriff in town, you could say. Um, isn't the devil still doing stuff on planet Earth? So isn't he still gaining access? And I would, I would describe it this way. On this side of the cross, so after the resurrection, can people still send their heads off and give the devil access? Yes, that hasn't changed. But what has changed is there's a new sheriff in town, and it's the church. 
It is the church of Jesus. As he says, the, this power structure has changed. And so now my people, with my spirit, full of identity, full of my life, can go out and they can actually push back the darkness in my name. That is, that's the difference that has been made on planet Earth. And, and so I just want to show you a, a few other verses, um, and then we're going to make some application. So James chapter 4, verse 7. It's just kind of uh, James sort of rephrases everything that we've been saying here. He says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. He will flee. And, it, and the ultimate submitting ourselves to God is when we bow our knee to King Jesus and say, I belong to you. I choose to believe in your cross and your forgiveness and your resurrection and all that means for my salvation. And I am going to become your follower and I'm going to do my best by your help to follow you all my days. And it says that when we are submitted to him, uh, we can actually resist the devil and he has to flee. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, does say to these Christians living in Ephesus, it says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold, Christian. Is it possible for Christians to give the devil a foothold? It's possible, otherwise it wouldn't be written uh, there, to Christians, don't give him a foothold. And so again, this is where, this is why, this is why and, and Jim Hall did a great job. If you didn't get to hear his message this past Sunday, he, he talked about all of this, is that um, we can, by our choice, we can start to get into patterns of sin uh, where somehow over time, and I, I can't quantify it, but somehow, through our sinful choice over long periods of time, the devil can get some sort of access to us, even as believers. And so if you ever find yourself in a place where you are trying to resist the devil and he's not fleeing, you're, you're, you feel like, man, there's still, just, there's still pushback, there's still darkness around me or in my life, you have to go back to James 4, 7. And you have to take a good look at your life and go, are there areas of my life where I am not submitted to God? Are there any areas of my life where I'm in rebellion? Uh, are there any areas in my life where I'm going, uh, I know God, but no, and I'm just going to go my own way. Rebe and Jim said this Sunday, rebellion's dangerous. He says rebellion's worse than witchcraft. Uh, somehow it, it gives access. And so, so we have to, this again, if I, and I'll just say this, this is just sort of tactical. If I ever feel like there is some sort of, you, ever, you know, you ever just have a bad week or a bad day and you're like, it's a bad week and it's a bad day, but then you ever feel like sometimes there's just extra? You're like, okay, this is like, and not even extra per se, but the timing of it is really suspicious. You're like, Huh. You know, I was getting ready to have this important conversation with my teenager and then this thing blew up. Or I was getting ready to serve at church in this way and this thing blew up. Or I was, you ever know, this is again, I get this question a lot. People will go, well, how do you know if it's just a bad day and it's just bad circumstances or it's just, you know, sinful people being sinful? And how do you ever know if the devil's actually behind something? And I usually will say this. Number one, you can pray for discernment. That is something that the Holy Spirit will give to you. You can say, Jesus, would you just show me what's going on? Like, could I have some discernment? Is this just circumstantial? And it's just a really rotten week? Or is there something behind this? Um, so you can pray for discernment. But also, you can notice patterns and places and timing. Patterns, places, and timing. Uh, I remember one time I, I uh, flew into a city that I was getting ready to do a week of ministry teaching in this city. And 
on the plane ride going to this city, I'm, I mean, I'm abiding in Jesus. I'm thinking about what I'm going to teach that week. I feel peaceful. I feel great. Um, I land in this airport and I start walking through the concourse to go get my baggage. And all of a sudden, I am just being bombarded with all of these thoughts about money. All these thoughts about money. And it, like, you don't have enough. You're going to run out. You're going to be poor. You're going to, and all of a sudden I start having all this anxiety about money and, and do I have enough and do I need more? And, and I'm, and I'm walking through this airport and then I, I go, wait a minute. Maybe these thoughts are not originating from me. Guys, not every thought that comes into your head is from you. And so you have to notice sometimes, where is this coming from? So that particular city um, is known for huge commerce and business. It's the headquarters of some of the largest corporations in the world. And I just think, you know what I just came under is the influence of some of the spiritual forces of darkness that hang out in this city. And I'm like, okay, something's going on here. So I just said, in the name of Jesus, any, any spirits of, you know, greed or of, of, you know, whatever. I don't remember what I said. I don't have a formula prayer, but I was just like, any, any force of the darkness trying to influence my mind around money, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And it stopped, and I was fine. And I had a great time of ministry in that city. So, again, just notice locations. Also notice timings. Um, <laughs> It, it, it just never fails. I've, I've talked to, to Pastor Jim. I've talked to Pastor Lee about this. We all kind of share this. Usually before we get up to preach messages on Sundays, we'll have some fire, some crisis, some conflict that will erupt within 24 to 48 hours of the time that we have to get up to preach. Like all the time. And so you, you just after a while, you just start to go, okay, there's a pattern here. Um, so be prepared for it, um, is that, that the heat's going to get turned up to distract you. Um, so, so these are just some of the ways that we can, we can discern. Um, but what I'll just get back to the, to the James 4, 7 here, is that if I feel like, okay, the timing, the place, um, all of that, it's, it's pretty suspicious. I suspect maybe there's some warfare against me, um, I'll, I'll take inventory, you guys, and I'll just kind of look and I'll go, is there any area of my life where I am not submitting to God? I'll basically look, say, are there any gaps in my armor? You know, the armor of God, are there any gaps? And if there are, if there's any unconfessed sin, I confess that. And I go to God and I just say, God, I am yours. I submit to you, your lordship, your leadership. You're my king. I want to follow you. Um, and, and then I will resist. I'll say, and if there's any forces of darkness that are trying to mess with me, be gone in the name of Jesus. I like to say these things out loud. I don't think the devil can read your thoughts. So I'll say it out loud because um, Jesus said things out loud. So if it's good enough for Jesus, uh, I'll do it. And, um, and so is this making sense, you guys? So, so submit yourself to God, resist the devil, uh, and he'll flee. Um, I'm going to be doing a class, like I said, in... In a couple of weeks, so starting next Wednesday, I'm doing a class called Understanding the Supernatural. Uh, and in that class, in the second week of that class, I'm going to basically repeat a lot of what I'm teaching tonight. So you might be like, oh, I signed up for that class and it's going to be all the same thing. Yes, but I will go a little bit deeper into some of these things and tell some more stories around them. Um, and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into James 4-7 uh, in that Okay, let me wrap this up here. Um, you guys, there is a big difference between having authority and using your authority. And, and so, remember I said authority in Jesus is a legal thing. So if you belong to him, you can, you can transact in his name. Um, but, but we have to actually use his name. Um, and... When I, when I usually teach this, I usually do a thing to embarrass myself, but I'm gonna, I, I'll probably do it tonight. I'll just do it. If you've, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in this class before and seen me embarrass myself in this way, um, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. 
So just imagine with me that tonight I go home and my wife is, you know, she's down the street at a friend's house. My kids are all out and I pull up to my house and um, the house is dark, but there's a strange van parked in my driveway. And I look a little closer and I see lights moving around in my house and I realize somebody's ripping me off. And so what do I do as a you know, citizen of Fayetteville? I call 911 and I call the people who have the real authority from the city of Fayetteville. They've got the real badges and the real guns. They can really arrest the bad guys. And so I call Fayetteville police and four cruisers come pulling up in front of my sidewalk. And I'm like, yes. And these, these guys get out, they got the badges, they got the guns, and they line up on my sidewalk, and they start to sing and dance going, we are the cops, and we got badges, and we got guns, and we arrest bad guys just for fun, because we are the cops. Okay, that's embarrassing, right? But you know, they're doing this song and dance, you're never gonna forget that. Um, but as they're doing their song and dance about their authority, these guys load up all my stuff in their van and they take off. And you go, Kevin, yeah, that is embarrassing. My wife always said, don't do that song and dance thing in public. But anyway, I have to. But, um, but you go, okay, the church of Jesus, we are the ones who can say, stop that in Jesus' name. And the devil, I feel like, is looting the planet. And so many of our families and so many of our, our friends and lives. And, and I love worship and I love to sing about the name of Jesus. And I love to sing, you know, there's a song that you, we used to sing and it's like, there's power in the name, there's power in the name, there's power in the name of Jesus. And we love to sing about that. But are we actually using what has been given to us. And so, how we use the name of Jesus is given to us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. So this is right after Paul has said to the Ephesians, put on the armor of God, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, all that stuff, take your stand. But he's not done yet. Because he goes, and, and and praying. So guys, this is, this is where the real spiritual warfare comes into play. And praying at all times in the Spirit or with the power of the Spirit, guidance of the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, all kinds of requests. He says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication or, or praying for all the saints. So he says, you guys, we, we can't just cower in fear. We actually have to go on the offense and we need to pray. We need to pray and use the authority in Jesus name in the place of prayer. So I have a little phrase um, that I, I got this years ago from um, uh, a, a seminar that I, I was in on spiritual warfare, and it just has always stuck with me, so I just want to pass it on to you. And, and it's this phrase, push back the enemy, pray down the kingdom. And when we're talking about pray down the kingdom, we're talking about basically pray that God's kingdom, his rule, his reign, his authority, what he wants to happen, happens. Um, so we're praying his kingdom come. Uh, in people's lives and in our city and in our churches and in our families and in nations. So we push back the enemy and then we pray down the kingdom. So can you guys say this with me here? Let's just practice together. Say, push back the enemy, pray down the kingdom. Push back the enemy, pray down the kingdom. Okay, so can we actually do this um, for... For people, how, do, how does this actually work? Because here's the thing. Is the enemy today trying to gain access to people's lives? Is he trying to gain access to any of your family members? Is he trying to gain access at the University of Arkansas? Is he trying to gain access at New Heights Church? He's, he's, it says he's prowling around like a roaring lion. He's, he's looking for 
Where can I get access? Where can I get access? Where can I find an entry point? Um, at the same time, the Holy Spirit is at work. God is at work influencing and speaking and moving. And so what Jesus says to us is he says, church, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. So let me give you a, a, an example. This is a dramatic example, but it, it, it makes for a good teaching illustration. I was, uh, I was doing this class, and I had one of the, um, there's a Christian fraternity on campus at the University of Arkansas, and this guy um, was the chaplain of that fraternity. And I did this teaching, and he's like, Kevin, will this work for my dad? And I said, well, what's going on with your dad? He said, my dad's an alcoholic, and... It's, it's getting really out of control. It's really bad. Um, and so my mom, she's been trying to talk to him and try to, you know, say, get into rehab. All of us kids, we're pleading with our dad, please, dad, go to rehab. And the more that we try to talk him into going to rehab, the more he just digs his heels in and he's like, uh-uh, I'm not going. And so I said, well, let's do this right now. His name was Parker. I said, Parker, let's, let's push back the enemy and pray down the kingdom in your dad's uh, life. So I said, tell me your dad's name. And I said, so we just did it together. We said it out loud. And there's not a formula, but just basically um, any way that the forces of darkness are trying to access Parker's dad, any, any type of spirit that's trying to just reinforce that addiction uh, trying to get him to hide in darkness that's deceiving him, whatever, we cut off and push back in the name of Jesus. And I believe that when Parker and I, we use the name of Jesus out loud, whatever spirits were around Parker's dad had to go. And so as they're going, then we start to pray, Holy Spirit, get him. <laughs> so we're like, Spirit of God, now we ask that you would just open Parker's dad's heart and his mind open his eyes that he sees just how destructive this is he sees his need um that that he becomes convinced he needs to go to rehab uh whatever in, in jesus name amen we prayed some kind of prayer like that and i said parker just go home and and uh this week just push back the enemy pray down the kingdom in your dad's life and uh and just keep praying and and i said your dad might tomorrow just, you know, he might open himself up and, and uh, give access again, but just, you just, just do warfare prayer for your dad. Um, he literally came to me the next week and he said, Kevin, my dad just called and said he's checking himself into rehab. And I was like, hallelujah. Um, he's like, it worked. And I'm like, okay, that's a powerful story. It's not always that fast. It's not always that dramatic, but I would like to think that that prayer really made a difference. And so you can pray this way for lost loved ones. Uh, you can pray this way um, for cities, for nations, um, for institutions, for churches. Push back the enemy, pray down the kingdom. All right. How are we doing here? Um, it's about uh, 10 after 8, and... I, I was thinking about doing something tonight that just to kind of wrap up that I usually don't do in this, in this talk, but I feel like it would be encouraging. And so, again, if you have signed up for the Understanding the Supernatural class, you're going to hear this story again. So I don't know if you like repeats. You're like, okay, I need some reps, um, but I'm, I'm going to tell this story because Starting in this class next week on understanding the supernatural, we're going we're gonna to talk about the supernatural realm. And so we're going to talk about uh, demons. We're going to talk about angels. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so what I'm going to do in that, in that class is I'm going to specifically talk about angels. I didn't have time to really talk about angels in this class tonight. Um, but as I start to talk about, you know, I really don't love teaching on spiritual warfare. It's not my favorite topic. Um, but, uh, 
As we talk about the forces of darkness, I would love to end just on a high note and on some encouragement and tell you an angel story, a, a true angel story. Would you guys be encouraged and want to hear that? Um, okay. So this is how we're going to end tonight. Um, so what I've been teaching tonight just on um, spiritual warfare and the nature of the enemy and submit, resist, James chapter 4, verse 7, was, was taught to me the first time in a week-long class that I went through as a part of a missionary training school that I was in as, as a you know, young 20-something. And so this guy who came to teach in our school, uh, his name was Dr. Hal Curtis. And um, Dr. Hal Curtis had an amazing testimony. I don't have time to tell it here tonight, but basically how he came to Jesus uh, is he was actually messed up in the occult and he was practicing uh, the occult and, and some things and had an encounter with something that scared the daylights out of him. And so he threw everything in the trash and that next week he gave his life to Jesus. So that's his testimony. Uh, and so um, he started to do a lot of research and he started to do a lot of teaching and, and traveled the globe teaching on spiritual warfare. And he came and taught in my week of training. Uh, he ended up uh, becoming one of my mentors uh, we started a men's wilderness program together in northwest Montana, just outside of Glacier National Park. Uh, I lived with him for a couple of years, and we did this wilderness program together. He was a pastor uh, from northwest Montana and had pastored five different churches from West Virginia and coal mining country all the way over to uh, a number of churches in Montana. Um, and, and I would, uh, sometimes he would tell this story in the classes that he would teach. Not always, but sometimes he would tell it. Um, and so um, when he became a believer, he, like I said, he had this thing that appeared to him. He could see it with his eyes, scared the daylights out of him uh, from the enemy. And he said that after he became a Christian, these things would periodically show up and they just tried to torment him and tried to intimidate him. And, uh, and he had to learn very quickly how to resist him. And he had to learn very quickly his authority in Jesus. And so what he taught us, James 4, 7, submit yourself to God, resist the devil. Uh, he would tell a story of how he had one of those things uh, and, and he practiced James 4, 7, submit, resist, and the thing left. And, uh, and but he said that, that as these things were trying to mess with him, he said God's angels, the elect angels, the good ones, also started to appear to him. And he had his first encounter with God's angels in his dorm room in Bible college. Uh, because after he became a believer... Uh, he decided he was going to become a pastor, uh, went to Bible college in central Pennsylvania, and had his first encounter with God's angels. Um, and that's a wild story <laughs> that I don't have time to tell. Uh, he moved out to Montana and started pastoring a church out there. And he said that it was a time and a season in his life where everything just started going wrong all at once. And he said that... Um, the church that he was pastoring, he had some very difficult people in his church who were just being really mean to him. Sometimes the sheep bite, you know, <laughs> when you're shepherding, and he was getting bitten pretty hard by some of the people in his church, and that was just really breaking his heart. He got hepatitis right around that time, and it just really messed up his health long term, the bad kind of hepatitis. And one of the most tragic parts of the story of that season of his life is one day his second grader, his oldest son, David, came home from school one day with a headache, and three days later, he died. So he lost his, his uh, firstborn son. And right around that time, shortly after that happened, their house caught fire and burned to the ground, and they lost everything, wedding pictures, um, Everything, lost it all. Just the clothes that they had on their backs was all that they came out of the fire with. 
And so um, all of this just landed on him, and he got really angry with God. You can imagine, right? And he basically was just like, God, here I am trying to serve you and follow you, and, um, and I'm just, I'm done. And basically, he just said, I'm done pastoring. I'm done with all of this. And kind of like, God, you know where to find me if you want me, but, but I'm, I'm done. He said it was not too long after this that he was uh, getting ready to go deer hunting. And he was, his, some of his buddies were going to come early in the morning to take him deer hunting uh, down in the Swan River Valley area. And um, Joe's from Northwest Montana and knows this whole area really well. Uh, and these guys were coming to get him, but that night uh, before they came to get him, he was sleeping in his bed and uh, wife next to him, and he was awakened in the middle of the night, and he said, he looked, and there was a huge man standing on the side of his bed. And he, this wasn't, again, his first encounter with angels. He'd, he'd seen them before, and he's like, this is one of God's angels, showing up in my bedroom. And he said that the angel reached down into the bed and scooped him up like a kid in his arms. And he's, he's a pretty big guy. And he said the angel holding him in his arms like this just started to rise off the floor. And Hal said, I think I was awake because I looked up at the ceiling and I thought, we're going to crash into the ceiling at any minute. And he said, just as we got to the ceiling, he's like a hand went over my eyes and it's like all I could see was like mist. And he's like, I experienced that for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, he's like, it was like, whoosh, the hand was taken away. And he said, and I'm standing in this place. And right next to me is this big angel standing right here. And he said, I look out and I'm standing in this place that is just made of light. As far as you can see, it's just columns of light in every direction as far as you can see. And he said in one direction, he said the light was so bright, you couldn't look into it. It was blinding. And he's like, I just knew that's where the tangible presence of God was, was manifesting. And he said, just couldn't look into the light. And he said that as I'm standing in this place, he said there was this music. And he said the music was the most beautiful music you he had ever heard in his life. He said it was this big crashing music. Just he's like it was it was like swirling, almost like it was alive, swirling around me, um, crashing like waves all around. He said it was the most beautiful music. He's like it made you want to just laugh and cry and run and dance all at the same time. And he's like I'm taking all of this in. Angels just standing here. And he said then a voice spoke to him out of the light, twice. Uh, God spoke to him and said the same thing. And, and I won't share with you what God specifically said to him because it was just for him, um, but it was not uh, super encouraging. <laughs> Basically, what God said to him was that he needed to get his, his thinking and his attitude right. And, and so God spoke to him twice. And, and I love this part of the story said, just after God's voice spoke, he said, the angel standing here beside me took his arm and the angel put his arm across his body like this and then started to go like this with his arm, kind of just pointing at this entire scene. And he said, and the angel quoted Romans chapter 8, verse 18. And here's what Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says. The angel said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And he said, as soon as the angel quoted Romans 8, 18, he's like, that hand went back over my eyes. And he's like, I couldn't see. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, it was gone. And I'm back in my bed. Angel's gone. Wife's still asleep. And he's like, what just happened? But he's like, I think I actually was somehow physically in that thing. He said, because this was one of the craziest, if the story isn't already crazy, <laughs> he's like, this was one of the craziest things. He's like, that music that I heard was coming out of me like a loudspeaker, like I was a loudspeaker. 
He's like, somehow the music had absorbed into my body somehow and was just coming out of me. He's like, I'm just laying there. My wife can't hear it. He's got a, a German shepherd dog laying here by the side of the bed. Dog can't hear it. Music's just loud, just coming out of him as he's laying there in bed. It's like, this is the craziest thing. Now, you know what's kind of interesting about that? Do you remember when Moses in the book of Exodus goes up on the mountain with God and he spends 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with God? What happened to Moses' skin as he was in God's presence? Somehow God's glory had absorbed into Moses' skin and he was glowing. It was like coming out of Moses. It was like a, a similar thing with this music with, with Hal. He's like, it's the craziest thing. Well, obviously, he's like, I can't go back to sleep. He's like, the guys are going to come pick me up to go deer hunting in a couple of hours. So he's like, I'll just go down to the kitchen and make some breakfast. So he goes down. He's making his breakfast. Music's coming out of him in the kitchen. He's like, this is the craziest thing. It's like, the guys come. He goes in. He gets in their truck. Music's coming out of him. They can't hear it. He can just hear it. He's in the back seat. So he's just sitting in the back seat as they drive down to his deer stand. It's dark out. Walks out through the woods to his deer stand, climbs up in his stand, music's coming out of him. And at this point now, he is just worshiping and he's getting his heart right with God. And he's saying, God, yes, my present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed. And he just resurrenders and resubmits his whole heart and his whole life to God. And he said, as the sun came up over the mountains, the music just faded and faded and then was gone. And after that experience, he pastored for another 30 years. He actually just retired uh, at the age of 79 from full-time pastoring. And just this past year, he passed through Gates of Splendor to be with Jesus face to face. Um, so I wanted to leave us with just a story, a good story. To, and I was that a good story. Is that worth the extra there? Yeah? Okay. So here's what I want to do. I just want to pray for us, and, uh, and then we'll be done for the night. Thank you, Lord, um, just for the reality of everything that we have in Jesus. Thank you uh, that, yes, even though we live in this world and we have real enemies, we have the world and its system and its ways of thinking, we have... Uh, the flesh, these desires in us that get disordered. Um, and we have a real enemy uh, that's seeking access. We thank you for Jesus and your victory at the cross and through your resurrection. And we worship you, Jesus. And we fix our eyes on you. And we thank you for what you have entrusted to us. Lord, that you have given us your very spirit, the power of God to live within us, and you've given us your name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee bows and confesses that you are Lord. And so may we be uh, effective in the place of prayer to push back the enemy and pray down your kingdom in all the places that we go. And we love you. And we exalt you and we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Everyone said, amen. Amen.